Hi, um, I'm Dr. Jonathan Fellers, and I will be presenting today about uh, uh, the role of employment in recovery from substance use disorders. Uh, let me pull up my slides here and we can kind of get started. I'm hoping that I can get through the slides and leave some time at the end for some questions. And um, if you can uh, put your questions in the question part, hopefully then we can kind of go through that in an orderly manner. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a native Mainer and I had the good fortune of being able to return to Maine after training in uh, psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. I was most recently before moving to Maine out at OHSU and the Portland VA in the other Portland and moved back to Maine um, about five years ago now. And more recently, I've been in, uh, started a private practice. I'm also um, the medical director of Crossroads, which is uh, primarily women's based uh, residential treatment program, also runs the camp program, the children and mothers program, and we also have outpatient services. And I'm also medical director at the South Portland Discovery House, which is a methadone program. And my private practice, I see general psychiatry as well as co uh, management of co-occurring uh, disorders like addiction and mental health. They often go hand in hand. Uh, so this, uh, this topic is really uh, close uh, to heart with me because I do feel that uh, employment is uh, a really critical aspect of um, uh, treatment and, and is really a component of good long-term recovery for individuals with substance use disorder. Um, let's see here, make sure I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, relevant to this talk. Um, and hopefully uh, by the end of this, we can achieve the learning objectives, which include understanding the evidence behind employment and recovery, uh, learning the ways that employment aids recovery and have a discussion of the barriers or the obstacles to employment for individuals who have a history of substance use disorder. Um, the, overall, this will be a kind of an outline of how I approach this talk. So first we'll talk about some gen general statistics of substance use disorder and rates of employment, for example. We'll also talk about uh, whether individuals with substance use disorder, are they interested in seeking employment? And then if they are interested, what is their ability to actually do work? And then we'll talk about those obstacles many may face uh, for employment. And then we'll talk about that relationship and the importance of work to recovery, and then talk about um, some programs who actually use employment or work as treatment. And finally, uh, we'll talk about some of the employment interventions that have been studied uh, over all in this area. So substance use disorders, this is a Im very important topic and not least of which is because of the huge amount of uh, money that uh, the burden of substance use disorders have uh, on our country. This is just from the United States, $600 billion impact. And it's not due to primarily healthcare costs or the criminal justice costs overwhelmingly it is because of lost productivity, so the loss of uh, employment, um, and that's over 70% of that economic burden is due to that. Um, who, how does, it, how does this kind of come play out? So in one study, a survey of 800 people in substance use disorder treatment, so people in treatment, only 26% of those individuals were employed. So about a quarter of individuals in substance abuse treatment are currently employed. And of those who are unemployed, the vast majority, over 50%, attribute that directly to the impact of their substance use, whether it be from impairments from substances, poor uh, ability to uh, uh, make it into work, absenteeism, and other consequences as a result. Um, Unemployment is a chronic problem for those with substance use disorders. Um, 
The DASIS national sample of individuals with substance use disorders describes really only 31.2% employment for adult patients with substance use disorders. So again, low numbers. In another study, DATO's multi-site treatment study, these are individuals actually in treatment at that time. Employment after treatment, one year later after seeking treatment was only 43%. So there's not a huge improvement in employment. And even five years later, still is uh, you know, barely over 50% uh, who had sought treatment are employed by that point. And uh, another study by uh, Lade, um, individuals in recovery, so people who've actually, so whereas that previous study was people who had completed treatment, these are actually individuals who have sustained recovery and in a variety of recoveries, whether it be newly found recovery to 10 years sober, even then fewer than half were employed. Why is this happening? Why are individuals with substance use disorder, why are there such low employment numbers? Well, it is uh, due to some extent because of the substance use disorder itself. Those who have resolved substance use disorder are less likely to be employed or retired, and they're more likely to be unemployed or disabled. Those, in addition, when we take a look at subgroups of um, these populations, certain factors are highly associated with unemployment. So those identifying as black are additionally disadvantaged and uh, protective factors are things such as higher level of education, um, and lower levels of criminal justice involvement are also protective. So some of the, uh, some factors that are pre-existing in individuals with substance use disorder also impact this. There have basically been described four domains that um, either alter the, uh, the odds for employment, um, sex being one, being male doubled the rate of employment in individuals, um, and race being Caucasian also doubled the rate of employment. So certain factors of individuals do have an impact on this. Um, having ongoing mental health problems uh, was a risk factor for unemployment. So individuals who uh, uh, have mental health issues are less likely to be employed. And the same is true for physical health issues. Having physical health issues also halved the odds of being employed. Interestingly enough, no index of actual substance use, lifetime severity, use in the past year, abstinence duration, or anything actually predicts employment status. Just having a substance use disorder itself reduces the risk. It's not, uh, uh, it's not part of recovery or recent, recency of substance use that alters that. So what is going on? Well, one thing could be that maybe individuals with substance use disorders aren't interested in employment. It is true that substance use disorders typically cause severe impairments in multiple areas of functioning. And so they may not be interested in employment because there's other things going on that are of higher priority. However, when they have taken a look at individuals, employment is consistently the second most important priority for individuals. So in general, people are interested in employment having, uh, at, in the second position. And that interest in employment does change over time. So this study um, took a look at justice-involved individuals with substance use disorder in three different post-treatment settings. And what they found was that over time, the activities of interest changed. Really at baseline, individuals were much more focused on reading, writing, solitary activities, exercise, and sports. And after a year in uh, treatment, um, they started to be more interested in entertainment, education, and work activities. 
And really by two years later at the final point where they took a look at these individuals, education work was the primary interest that they had and interacting with others was also way up there. And so if you take a look at this trend, individuals with substance use disorder, when they first seek treatment, they really are focused on solitary activities. And that seems to be the primary um, area that they're focused on. Whereas later on, as they uh, accrue uh, sobriety, they start focusing more on work and social activities. So it may be a factor of when we're asking these individuals. Well, are individuals with substance use disorder able to work? So another factor of why there is such a high association with um, uh, unemployment might be that because of the substance use disorder, they, uh, um, they might not have the ability to work. However, what we have found consistently is that characteristics such as diagnosis, duration, or severity of those problems is not associated with employment outcomes. Really, there's only two things that influence employment outcomes. And they are whether someone is motivated, whether the person wants to work, which based on the previous couple of slides, it does seem clear that individuals with substance use disorder do want to work and self-efficacy, whether they think they can. And this is the area, the primary area where individuals with substance use disorder may be lacking that sense that they have the confidence, self-efficacy and ability to kind of do work. And we know they're interested in it, but they don't believe they can do it. What are some of the obstacles to employment that people face? Well, there, there are quite a few. Um, first, the substance use disorders do cause severe impairments, especially with active use in multiple areas of functioning, including cognitive um, and memory. And so there may be some challenges with active substance use. In addition, it is not uncommon for individuals with substance use disorder due to have, having high absenteeism in the workplace. And, and also needing to leave employment to attend treatment or because of incarceration, that they have a lot of gaps and a poor work history. And so it makes it very challenging um, to find work when your resume uh, is very spotty. In addition, due to the illicit nature of substances, as well as the illicit nature of a lot of the behaviors associated with substance use disorder, for example, open open container laws, public intoxication, OUIs, a lot of these behaviors that are associated with substance use disorders are also criminal. And so a lot of individuals with substance use disorders have a criminal history, and that is an obstacle. Finally, stigma. So uh, more so than I believe many other diagnoses, substance use disorder is highly stigmatized and people are not really wanting to share that they have this problem due to the stigma that they actually feel. In addition, individuals with substance use disorder, it's been shown that they have lower educational attainment, perhaps from, um, from their substance use, that it has impacted their schooling, that they have not finished high school, that they have not finished college due to their substance use. They have poor interpersonal skills. So there's a lore in substance use field that when individuals uh, start using their substance, um, what they end up doing is they stop maturing from that point. And so they turn to substances as a means of coping and they don't have that natural maturation that occurs. And so they don't develop interpersonal skills and that is a deficit for employment. They, they've also been um, questioned whether people have poor motivation to work. However, those previous slides do show that people are interested, maybe not acutely at the time of treatment, but later on for sure. 
And it may also be due to a lack of vocational and job skills. Lack of transportation. This is a problem that I see a lot. People may have lost um, their license due to OUI or fines, and they haven't been able to uh, pay all those fines. And so they don't have vehicle transportation and a lot of employment really relies on transportation. Um, I wonder if this is gonna change. You know, With this pandemic, we have really seen a lot of people working from home with technology and transportation has been less needed. And so it is curious, maybe this will be something, a good positive change that has come as a result of this pandemic. A lack of childcare. So um, I have definitely seen this as an obstacle for recovery. I ran a, um, pregnant and parenting women's group for Suboxone. And one of the challenges these women face is they often were single parents raising children and they had a lack of childcare and they could not find employment because they could not afford or find childcare to enable them to do so. Um, lack of computing and technical skills. This is associated with um, leaving school early. And also requirements, whether it be criminal requirements for probation, having to check in, or treatment. A lot of substance use treatment is quite intense. If you take a look at some of the levels of care that we have, things like um, residential treatment, you are actually in a location full time. It is impossible to do a job while you are in residential treatment. And other levels of care, like partial hospital program or intensive outpatient, really require a lot of time. By definition, IOP, intensive outpatient, is at least nine hours a week. And so few jobs will permit someone to be absent you know, for those three days a week. Um, in addition, um, a lot of substance use treatment requires frequent appointments and it has a lot of monitoring requirements. So having to do urine drug screening to monitor um, an individual. And that can be really challenging if you have a job that requires you to be there. You can't be in two places at the same time. So why are we focused on this? Well, it has been long established that employment is an outcome that we look for when we evaluate substance use treatment. And it's also been a factor that is associated with positive outcomes. So not only is it a good thing, um, an outcome that we look at, it's also something that enhances recovery. In addition, in particular, employment provides legitimate in sources of income. Individuals with substance use disorder often have to rely on um, the black market economy, such as uh, dealing drugs or other uh, stealing to uh, uh, feed their habit, and work itself provides an, an, an a legitimate income source. Um, it also provides structure. Um, structure is really critical to good outcomes and being able to stay away from substances. Um, I have a four-year-old son, and when he misses his nap, he is really difficult. And I don't think us adults are any better when our structure gets interrupted. Uh, one of the biggest things that we can provide in treatment is structure. And so if you look at our treatment, a lot of it is structure. Residential treatment is extremely structured, gives you three meals a day, you're someplace all the time. And that structure reduces anxiety, enhances ability to recover. And IOP also provides structure three days a week, five days a week, several hours a day gives you that structure. And work is very similar. It gives you a place to go consistently. And so there's a lot less um, time to um, be worrying about things. Work also offers a real important uh, ability to be able to make, get some social connections and also to be around individuals who don't have substance use disorders. Um, there may not be in, the, in their group, in, in their socialization group, they may only know people who use substances. So work offers an alternative environment where positive connections can be made. 
It also is very important for um, uh, self-esteem. And as we saw, we know they're motivated for work, but they really lack in a sense of self-efficacy that they can do it. And so work itself enhances self-efficacy. And so it begets um, better ability to work. It's also important as far as uh, recovery outcomes because it does uh, reduce the risk of relapse. And it does so in several ways. One, by providing that structure, providing meaning for that individual so that being sober uh, has um, more has value, and so in general, if you think about these things, substance use disorders, you have to have more reasons for staying sober than reasons for using, and so work can provide some of those reasons and, and help maintain recovery. It also provides purpose, and the income can fulfill survival needs. Um, Employment is really one of the best predictors of positive treatment outcomes. And so we often, in, in, in addition to substance, you know, recovery factors like abstinence from substances or uh, absence of cravings, often when we evaluate treatment, we look at employment as an outcome as well. And employment is positively associated. It lowers rates of relapse, also predicts less criminal activity, fewer parole violations, and uh, improved quality of life. So work enhances the outcomes that are already there. Um, and this is kind of um, well established because when we take a look at what recovery is, work is kind of a component of recovery. SAMHSA's definition is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And when we take a look at the dimensions of recovery, it's really important to notice that employment education is a component of recovery. And so seeking employment really does seek recovery and their they're mutually beneficial to each other. And really it's integral to recovery. Um, when we look at people in recovery and who have achieved long-term recovery, most have achieved um, at least one major achievement such as self-improvement, family engagement, civic or economic participation. So the longer someone is in recovery, the more achievements they do uh, accrue and over time, the, that achievement is really associated with greater self-esteem, quality of life, ha happiness, and recovery capital. And I would posit that what recovery is doing is it's really improving that domain of self-efficacy and enabling people to achieve in work because they, we know they're interested in it. It's just they don't believe they can. And as they achieve more and more recovery, their self-esteem improves. And so their ability to work actually increases. You know, employment is well ingrained in 12-step um, recovery programs. The big book of AA, um, there's actually a chapter in it, chapter 10, to employers. Um, and what I love about how the big book describes employment is how the terms they use about individuals with substance use disorder. Um, because of the employee's special ability or his own strong personal attachment to him, the employer has sometimes kept such a man at work long beyond a reasonable period. I love the language that the 12-step programs use to speak about individuals um, uh, with alcohol use disorder. They describe individuals as really amazing employees, but they have this alcohol use disorder too. And so by doing so, it really, you know, it says, you know, even though alcohol may be considered a vice, this alcoholism, one of the characteristics that also comes with alcoholism is they're really good employees too. They, you know, as a class, they're energetic. They have a lot of energy and they work and 
play hard. And so when someone is in recovery, an alcoholic is in recovery, they become one of the best employees at, for an organization. There have been um, even thoughts of kind of using work itself as the treatment for substance use disorders. The classic, um, I guess, uh, manifestation of this is like the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Centers. So Salvation Army really takes this to the extreme. What they do is they provide a six month treatment program that is absolutely free. And what they uh, really say is the treatment is actually working. They use work itself as the treatment. Um, and individuals who enter are provided with a clean and healthy place to stay, food, work therapy, meaning they have to work. Work is part of um, the treatment and they work in the retail locations. And um, they also have leisure activities, group and individual counseling and spiritual direction and resources to develop life skills. Um, this can be really helpful. So as we know, individuals with substance use disorder may have uh, histories that don't look very good on their resume. They may have criminal histories, they may lack uh, skills, they may have spotty employment. And what Salvation Army does is they take these individuals and during that six month period, those individuals have a steady job where they can develop skills such as like driving the truck that uh, deliver, takes um, the donations uh, to the center. So it can even earn like their class C uh, commercial license or develop skills in retail, working at the, at the stores. And they can use that on their resume to get the next job. So the, what Salvation Army does is it gives, it fills in that employment history and enables them to go somewhere else. However, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's a current kind of almost backlash against the Salvation Army model. And there's a current lawsuit in, uh, in California against Salvation Army contending that um, the individuals in treatment are, are kind of forced labor for free. Uh, essentially though, um, though the work therapy is their treatment, they are not really getting paid for it. They only get their, you know, their room and board, but they're, they're not earning the minimum wage that is with it. And so there's a, this lawsuit is actually taking a look at this. And currently as it is, they, they say that it's violating a lot of California labor, labor codes due to minimum wage and overtime. Um, there are, there are a bunch of other programs very similar to this. I, I mentioned Salvation Army, but I see in the comments, someone mentioned the, the Goodwill Work Study Program, very similar kind of um, idea. And also there's this uh, program out in California. It's kind of spread a little bit, Delancey Street. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that program. It's very similar. It's a, it's a lot more for the criminal justice population in, what they do is they run a restaurant, Delancey Street, it's a restaurant and all, all the staff at the restaurant are in the program and it's a two year program and people sign up for it. They get a place to stay. Um, they get the training to be able to work in that environment and they're there for two years and they can establish a lot of skills like in the restaurant industry, uh, co um, cooking, serving, also, um, you know, marketing type things and they work for the organization and they stay there for two years and by the end of it, they have a two year history of work and they're really set up for a lot of success as afterwards. Um, so there, there is this use in, in, in history. Um, so how can we, I guess, intervene to, I guess, promote the good effects that, or at least try to provide the good effects of, that employment has for recovery for individuals? So um, one way um, you can do so is you through drug court. Often in drug court, um, it is required that someone get a job as a result of that. And um, in this study um, from 2007, they had individuals in drug court randomized to two groups. Basically they had the control group, which was treatment as normal. And then 
into this other group where they had a lot of uh, support services for employment and help finding it. And they subdivided that second group into low upgrading and high upgrading. Um, and so what they did is they took a look at how many of the sessions the individuals attended. And if they, the top 50% of attendance people were in the high upgrading group and then the lower attendance. So these are individuals who didn't go to any of those meetings was in the low upgrading group. So you could posit that maybe the high upgrading group are the people who are really motivated and wanted to do well and took advantage of the groups. Whereas the low upgrading, they didn't attend the groups and they may, might not have been as motivated. Um, what they found was the most positive predictors of employment was actually previous employment. So having previous employment predicted future employment. And they also found that the intervention, particularly the high upgrading group, it did lead to better employment outcomes and substance use disorder outcomes. So by supporting employment, especially if someone is attending and interested in doing it, does lead to better outcomes. Another um, uh, employment intervention that has been looked at is something called abstinent contingent wage supplements. So there's this thing called uh, contingency management, which is a well-established uh, treatment for substance use disorders. It's probably one of the most effective therapeutic approaches for stimulant use disorders. Essentially what it does is an individual provides a urine drug screen. And if their urine drug screen is negative, they get like a token. And when they get enough tokens, they can trade those in for like gift cards or like uh, radios or things like that. So you're basically paying for the outcome that you want, which is negative drug screens. And that works. Some of the audience may have even done that with their children. I'll give you $20 for every A on your report card. Contingency management works. Um, and so this, uh, this intervention used abstinence um, as so individuals were working and were had substance use disorders. And if they produced negative urines, they got uh, paid more than um, if their urine was positive. And what they showed was that there was a big improvement in drug use outcomes, kind of like what we see in contingency management. In particular, opiate and cocaine negative urine samples were much higher, twice as likely to be uh, negative. So 65% versus 45% for the, the contingent group versus the um, uh, treatment as usual group. In addition, employment outcomes were improved. So by, um, by providing this extra wage supplement, more people obtained employment. This was like almost four times um, the rate. So 60% found employment versus 28, uh, pretty significant. Um, another intervention that's been looked at is something called a therapeutic workplace, which is basically an employment-based incentive program. So by like, as long as you are staying sober and providing uh, as evidenced by negative urine drug screens, for example, you get more opportunities to work and more opportunities for employment. And so it's instead of giving you more money for your work, you just have more ability to work and that reinforces it. And uh, the therapeutic work has, uh, workplace has shown that many actually obtain employment at some term point. So kind of like the previous study where we had 59%, um, this has the same 59% sought employment. So with, you know, money is motivating in this sense. And most worked part-time or were employed at low wage jobs. So the type of jobs that individuals um, got weren't necessarily high paying though. And what we found is that individuals and substance use disorders because they're of their spotty uh, history, because of the low skills, they, they aren't, you know, they don't really always qualify for the best high paying jobs. And so food preparation and serving related fields are the most common. Um, 
there was a syst systematic a review of interventions, um, so including those ones that I just showed you in 2020, um, taking a look at all the interventions out there and what ones were helpful. Um, they found that uh, overall in the literature, people have tried lots of different things, um, nine different models in 14 studies. So people are trying all kinds of, no, people aren't trying the same things, they're trying all kinds of different things, at least right now. And what they found is that overall, the interventions to improve employment have low magnitude effects. So they're not super potent, but they do work. And overall, they uh, suggested that the best um, evidence and is for IPS. So IPS is individual placement and support. And it's well known for people with serious mental illness. Um, and it's basically, uh, since it's a well-established um, uh, 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 intervention, uh, it's not surprising that it's, it's helpful for substance use disorders. It's really been looked at a lot for major mental illness as well as co-occurring disorders and less frequently for just substance use disorder by itself. But what it does is it really helps people living with these conditions work at regular jobs of their own choosing. And so it's a very patient-centered approach. The key principles um, are that it's open to anybody and it focuses on competitive employment rather than supported employment. So jobs that are, um, that are out there, it provides rapid job search, targeted job development, and it really takes into account um, the preferences of the client. Um, and it has individualized long-term supports. It's integrated, so part of the treatment and includes benefits counseling. And over the 28 randomized controlled trials of IPS, it's really shown consistently. So if you look at this graph here, I know you probably can't see everything, but those black bars are IPS and the red bars are kind of like control. And as you can see, there's a whole lot more black than red on that diagram. So consistently, IPS has shown um, an advantage. And so of 27 out of the 28 shot, uh, studies showed significant advantage. And the employment rate for IPS compared to um, uh, control or treatment as normal, there was a 55% uh, 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 employment rate for IPS compared to 25% for controls. So interventions can work and do, um, do work for, um, for substance use disorders and helping individuals find employment. And we should be doing this because employment is an outcome in itself for substance use disorders, but also is associated with those outcomes that we want from substance use disorders, like um, uh, abstinence from substances, decreased craving, and improved quality of life. Um, that is my last slide. And so what I will do now is kind of like open it up for uh, questions. Um, Thank you very much for allowing me to speak about this uh, important topic. And what I'll do is I'll take a look at the, let's see, is it the chat or the question and answer? There's one, <laughs> Dr. Ellis, there's one question in the chat. All uh, right. Jessica is asking, how do you fund contingency management in practice, especially for those with stimulant use disorder? All right, great. So hi, Jessica. Um, Excellent question. How do you fund contingency management? Um, you know, for an evidence-based practice that is well established as the most effective for stimulant use disorder, it's also been shown to be helpful for basically every addiction, including cannabis and other things that we don't have great treatments for. Um, it's been funded essentially through grants. So People run uh, uh, research studies for interventions for substance use disorders, and they use the grant money to support the, the contingency management fund. There have been grant supports for programmatically. And so, um, for example, the VA does provide budget um, and some of their substance use treatment programs 
um, can provide contingency management funds for veterans. Uh, when I was working out at the Portland VA out in Portland, Oregon, we had a little budget that we used for contingency management for methamphetamine. Um, and it provided small prizes um, and um, that's how they funded it. Now, how do you do that in other settings? Well, so when I was working at uh, Maine Medical Center at McGeechee Hall in the outpatient psychiatry department, we actually had a very tiny uh, contingency management program where we used um, gift cards from Dunkin' Donuts, like $5 gift cards. Um, and we had it from the, the budget, the outpatient psychiatry budget uh, for negative urine drug screens. And we used that for one of our groups. Um, and so you can sometimes be creative. It's really unfortunate that even though it's well-established and is the most effective, that no insurance company pays for contingency management, even though it would probably save them money in the long run if they paid the members rather uh, for negative urine drug screens. It's um, it, it, hopefully one day as we uh, uh, start shifting towards populations and treating populations rather than individuals or fee for service, that there will be room for contingency management to be um, part of those programs. Um, let's say, I think I answered that question. That's excellent. Uh, Thank you. There's also uh, five questions in the Q&A section. Oh, cool. right. I can read them to you or I can. Uh, or sure, you can... let's do that. Okay, Ben is asking, are there any good studies known about specifically healthcare providers in parentheses, he puts RM, MD, DDS, reemployment after being diagnosed with SUD and obtaining a sense of recovery. Um, yeah, actually there is. So um, um, healthcare providers um, having a substance use disorder and, and professionals like healthcare providers, um, it's, you know, there's actually a lot of literature about it because there are programs uh, called, like Maine has one, the Maine Professionals Help Program, MPHP. Um, and there's a whole, every single state has a, uh, like physician health programs. And they're not always physician health programs. They often, they work not only for physicians, but also other, um, professionals in the healthcare field. So like psychologists, nurses, pharmacists, um, and they have been established because what they found out was that when uh, professionals have substance use disorders and classically what would happen is if the board of medicine or whatever found out about this sort of thing, that would be um, a, a big violation and people would lose their license. And uh, without treatment, what they found was like the suicide rate after um, without any treatment at all was incredibly high. And so the physician health programs were established because they, they recognized that just, um, just having a stick, no carrot um, was untenable. And so physician health programs were initiated to provide an alternative to discipline and actually treat these mental health disorders. And what they found is with enrollment in these health programs, which include uh, requirement for treatment, um, extensive monitoring, and often for um, up to five years, um, about 90% of individuals can go back to employment. However, not everybody can. Um, um, uh, Sometimes an individual might need to change fields. So uh, the classically, this has been described with like anesthesiologists. So since anesthesiologists have such ready access to certain medications, it might not make sense for them to go back to the field. But classically, and just because someone is a physician or a nurse or um, um, a pharmacist, they too can recover from these disorders and can return to the workplace with when they enter a stable long-term recovery. And the rate can be very high 
when there is um, a strong monitoring to assure that they are safe. Um, and some of the best outcomes in substance use disorder have been described in this exact population. Um, I think I answered that question. Um, let me go on. Uh, so next question is, this may be covered later in the presentation, but I'd like to know more about how to support a person. Oops, I don't see it anymore. Oh, wait. Uh, a person in recovery to build self-efficacy so they believe they will be successful in employment. Excellent question. And I hope I talked about it. I'm not really sure. But part of building self-efficacy is that's actually part of recovery. And building recovery capital is one of the best ways to, to do that. And um, one of the best ways to also build self-efficacy is to start employment because the way I usually think about this is you want to build a cycle of success. So individuals have had a lot of failures and when you put them back into the competitive workplace market, it can often be overwhelming because um, they've had failure every single time. And so starting with a more humble job can often uh, help someone establish that sense of self-efficacy that they can then go on to more competitive employment in the future. And so classically what happens is like in the recovery community here in Maine, there's a lot of sober housing. And often as part of entering sober housing, you have to get a job. And often people describe it as a recovery job. And so the perfect recovery job is kind of a low stakes, humble job that is relatively simple because starting at a simple job where you are more likely to get success, that can build self-efficacy and be a stepping stone to more competitive employment and a higher ranking thing to go next so that you have a positive cycle of success rather than a downward cycle of failure. Um, next question, what does the orange line on the graph indicate? Uh-oh, I don't know if I, hmm, orange line on the graph. I'm not really sure if I know the answer to that. Um, I think that was the, the IPS graph. So that oh, would be the control group. Oh yeah, let I me think. take, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint up again. Let's take a look. Oh boy. Oh, ha, ha. <laughs> well, I'm not incredibly adept at this. Let's see. Is this what we're talking about? The orange line here. Okay, so this this um, this uh, group here had two controls. I think they had an active control and a passive control, um, but it had two control groups. So um, that's what that orange line means. Um, let's see. Um, I don't, did I share my screen? I don't remember if I did or not. Nope. So if you see here, um, the orange line is here in this study and it's two control groups versus IPS. All right, um, the next question is, given the current labor shortage nationwide right now, is there a focus on building in new employment programs and support employees and employees with substance use disorder? It's a great question. I really hope we take this as an opportunity to do so. I do know that um, there is active work um, looking at in Maine, trying to incorporate um, employment solutions for the opioid epidemic. And this, is, this talk today is kind of part of that. It's, it's, it's a way for us to start at least moving the needle and at least raising awareness that employment is a critical part to recovery and an area that we really need to focus on and should be incorporated in, uh, in treatment for individuals. And I think it's, that would be a great marriage of, um, we have a lot of people now with substance use disorders who are interested in work, but don't know if they can do it. And we have a lot of labor shortage. And if we could connect those two, I think it, it, everybody would be happy. 
Um, let's see, next question. What is the best way to start the intervention process and navigate employment laws regarding requiring employees to seek treatment and be sensitive to employee rights? So I believe this question is referring to um, um, individuals who are currently employed and wanting, having those individuals seek treatment without jeopardizing um, their current employment is, I hope that's correct. I'm gonna answer it that way. So there are, um, there are a lot of uh, important laws that do protect individuals uh, who have substance use disorders um, and can help protect their job. So one of the, one of the important laws would be family medical leave act and that job if the employer is of 50 employees or more they they must hold someone's position so that that individual can seek treatment and it doesn't ask what you can't actually ask what kind of treatment they need um, and so it's really none of their business if it's substance use disorder treatment or not but that law is protective there's also um, a law, the American Disabilities Act, that if someone has uh, a substance use disorder and that's been established before, that, that there should be accommodations in the workplace. However, one of the big areas that um, does not protect someone is if someone, there is, uh, if someone, if, if an employer has a um, uh, drug screening as part of their policy and that individual tests positive. Um, there is the Drug Free Work uh, Place Act and that employee could be dismissed. And so the ADA protects people who are in recovery or in treatment, but not people who are breaking the law, which illicit drug use could be considered or who are impaired on the job. It doesn't people can be disciplined for that. So what I usually recommend is seeking FMLA um, to uh, first address the treatment and uh, going through employee health can be a way of doing that too. But um, seeking what is out there already and uh, before uh, coming to a problem where um, you could be dismissed. Um, and I think there are some uh, other um, comments um, out there. Let's see. Um, I'm going to try to answer one more question because I know we're running out of time. Um, I am a VRS at a large disability company, private sector, and work with claimants who sometimes have jobs to return to as long as an employer is holding it for them. What advice would you give me when working with people who go out of work with substance use disorder. Many times I try to get them to return part-time even while in IEP and ramp up to full-time. So, um, excellent question. Um, so work is an important part of recovery, but like we saw in the slides, individuals when they're first getting treatment, they're more focused on other things. And when people enter residential treatment, we really try to encourage them to leave their that desire to work beside because they have other, their priority right then should be actively addressing their substance use disorder rather than employing. Um, so in general, what can, I, what can you do about having people go back to work? When is the right time? Well, it's a delicate balance. Like I think work provides great structure, but treatment is also really critical and if treatment can occur along with employment, that would be ideal. However, treatment is pretty intense and attending IOP and um, going to work can be really challenging. And so I like the idea and I usually encourage my patients to try to go back to work part-time initially while they're going to IOP and then and wait a little bit before going full-time because they, uh, so they have the ability to attend IOP and take advantage of it. Um, that structure of work is really important, but it can be overwhelming. And so ramping up makes a lot of sense. Um, however, 
we really don't consider someone with a substance use disorder to be in remission from that substance use disorder until it has been three months that they're sober. So the best approach, I think, in some ways would be to have a hiatus in employment for three months so that that person can truly establish a good, uh, a good recovery. However, that's really kind of impossible with the realities of finances and, so, uh, and getting there. But that, that would be the ideal in my mind. Um, I'm sorry, but I think I've run out of time. I've ran out of time, run out of time. That's pretty good, Dr. Fellers. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to present and I'm gonna turn it over to the hosts. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will be sending out evaluation links and um, your certificates uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much, Dr. Fellows. This and is excellent just a couple, couple yeah. reminders for folks. This is Letitia Hutman from the Office of Behavioral Health Services. I want to say thank you, Dr. Fellows, for such an outstanding presentation and to Maine Medical Center Department of Book Services for coordinating the webinar and the upcoming webinar, September 22nd. So make sure you get that in your calendars where we'll be talking about addressing barriers to employees for employment for individuals who are in recovery from SUD. So, and that'll be a great opportunity for follow-up. This webinar has been recorded and we'll be posting it um, on the Office of Behavioral Health website. So you'll be able to share it with colleagues who might've missed this. So, um, you know, and please encourage your colleagues to also attend on the 22nd. Um, Lorena will be sending out a, in addition to the, um, evaluation, a document about the um, Department of Labor program connecting with the Opportunities Initiative for um, Mainers impacted by the opioid crisis. And that will actually be one of the um, um, pieces we'll, that will get highlighted at next month's webinar. Um, Doug Dunbar from the Eastern Maine Development Corporation will be able to share a little bit about that and looking at other things. So thank you all so much for attending. Thank you.